channel on this, the fourth Sunday of Easter. Uh, this is the Sunday that's known as Good Shepherd Sunday. It's a, it's a special service that we have every single year where we focus on readings that describe to us Jesus as being our Good Shepherd. Last year's sermon on Good Shepherd Sunday, I brought up an interesting phenomenon called sheep worrying, which is where sheep in a flock... Once they start worrying, they're anxious about something that's in the area, and the flock can just drop down dead because they worry so much. This year, as we celebrate Good Shepherd Sunday, we realize that we are sheep, and I think I'm not alone in saying that the anxiety level is just kind of creeping upward every day that we go along. Now, there are a lot of unknowns in our life. There are a lot of things that might be causing you anxiety right now. And if that's the case, I would encourage you to tune into God's Word this morning and to find comfort knowing that you have a good, great shepherd in Jesus Christ who will not leave you nor forsake you, but is guiding you through life, and he promises he will guide you to your home in heaven. Now we begin our service with prayer. O oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we have gathered here today to hear your word and to worship and praise your holy name. Grant that we may be strengthened in our faith and love by your holy word. Give us the comfort of knowing that with Jesus as our good shepherd, we have nothing to fear, but know that he works everything in our lives according to your plan and for our good. Hear us and bless us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Begin our service singing him 192 verses 1 and 6 through 8. <laughs>
the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess unto you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought, word, and deed. Wherefore, we flee for refuge to your infinite mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O most merciful God, who has given thine only begotten Son to die for us, have mercy upon us, and for his sake, Grant us remission of all our sins, and by thy Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of thee, and of thy will, and true obedience to thy word, to the end that by thy grace we may come to everlasting life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us, and has given his only Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. To those who believe in his name, he gives the power to become the sons of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this, Lord, unto us all. Sheepfolds. From following the nursing ewes, he brought him to shepherd Jacob, his people, Israel, his inheritance. With upright heart, he shepherded them and guided them with his skillful hand. But we, your people, the sheep of your pasture, will give thanks to you forever. From generation to generation, we will recount your praise. I am the Good Shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the
Almighty God, merciful Father, since you have wakened from the dead the shepherd of your sheep, grant us your Holy Spirit, so that when we hear the voice of our shepherd, we may know him who calls each of us by name and follow where he leads. This we pray through the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and rules with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. lesson comes from Ezekiel chapter 34. We'll be reading verses 11 through 16. No matter how dire and dark and depressing things seem to be getting, Jesus tells us that he's the good shepherd for whom nothing is impossible. He paints this picture in Ezekiel chapter 34 that he is the great shepherd where wherever his sheep are scattered and no matter what situation they find themselves in, he will seek them out. He will lead them to pasture. He will lead them to good grazing land where they will feed and be full. He tells us that he will find those who are lost and who are strayed, and he will bring them into his pasture. Ezekiel 34. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, I myself, will search for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his sheep that have been scattered, so will I seek out my sheep, and I will rescue them from all places where they have been scattered on a day of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and will bring them into their own land. And I will feed them on the mountains of Israel, by the ravines, and in all the inhabited places of the country." I will feed them with good pasture, and on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land, and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep, and I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, and I will bring back the strayed, and I will bind up the injured, and I will strengthen the weak, and the fat, and the strong, I will destroy I will feed them in justice. So far, the word of the Lord. Our second reading comes from John chapter 10. We'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Jesus calls himself the, the good shepherd throughout Scripture, and later on in John chapter 10, he calls himself the good shepherd. But here he calls himself the sheep door, or the gate into the pasture of his sheep. So he kind of stands on both sides of this issue. Not only is he the shepherd, but he's also the entrance to the sheepfold. Jesus is using this to tell us that as he is the good shepherd, he has also given us other shepherds, like myself, or Pastor Sharon back before me, or the teachers which God has called into our congregation. How can we tell a shepherd from a false shepherd? Well, it's those who enter through the door. Those who come proclaiming Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Those who come not proclaiming themselves, but Jesus as the only way to salvation. We have no confidence in any shepherds in this life. But when we have confidence in Christ Jesus as our great good shepherd, then we have confidence for eternal life, and then we can be, a, we can be certain that the shepherds that God has given us is leading us there. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the gatekeeper opens. The sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name, and he leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. The stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the, stranger, the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Here ends the 
word of the Lord. We'll now join in confessing our Christian faith following the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, children. On Thursday night, I decided I was going to try camping outside with my children, my two oldest sons. And so we set up a tent in the backyard and we went camping. As it got darker, my, we were telling stories in the tent and my boys started getting sleepy and they fell asleep and I did not. I was laying there in the tent and all I could think about was all the different sounds that I could hear in the neighborhood. People driving by with their music loud, people walking by, which was kind of scary. You could hear a lot of big dogs barking nearby, a couple cats screeching now and then. Lots of roosters crowing, and there was just generally a lot of noises which kind of put me on edge and made me a little bit scared. I was having a really tough time falling asleep because all I could think about was that I was outside with just a thinly walled tent and just a zipper protecting me and my, my precious sons from all of the scary dangers out there. It was really getting to me, and after laying awake, awake for a couple hours, all of a sudden, I remembered the psalm that I'd been studying for this Sunday's service, and I'm going to read it to you here. Perhaps you've heard it before. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Throughout this service, we keep hearing all these different readings and descriptions of Jesus being the shepherd and we being the sheep. Do you have any idea how many times in the Bible Jesus is referred to as our shepherd? It might surprise you. It's over 300 times. That's a lot of times for this one illustration. But God uses it so often because it is the perfect picture of the relationship that he has with us. I don't know if you've ever seen sheep before, but they don't have long claws to protect themselves from enemies. They don't have sharp fangs. They don't have venom that they can bite people with and kill them. They really don't have hardly any defense mechanism at all. They're just kind of slow, kind of dumb animals with a lot of fluffy fur on them. They totally depend on a shepherd to take care of them and to give them every single thing that they need in order to survive, in order to stay safe. And that's the relationship that I have and that you have with Jesus. By ourselves, we are defenseless. And maybe there are times where you're feeling like I was feeling when I was in that tent, kind of scared, kind of uncertain about what was lurking around the corner, and you were kind of afraid to go on. Well, it's times like those we can remember that Jesus is our shepherd, that he's with us every step of the way through our lives, that he promises that even when we are in the darkest, scariest shadows of death, that we don't have anything to be afraid of because Jesus is with us. We know that any enemy that this world has to throw at us, Jesus can beat them. Jesus has already defeated the very worst of our enemies in the devil and in death. Jesus tells us we don't have to fear those things anymore because he's taking care of all of them. He tells us that his goodness and his love, they are going to remain with us every single day of our lives. 
and that we're going to dwell with God in heaven forever. So if you hear something go bump in the night and you hear some scary noises and then you, you're worried about maybe something that's in your closet or under your bed and you have all these fears popping up, you don't have to be afraid because you have the great good shepherd Jesus who promises that he can take care of all of those things. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forget about you. He promises he'll be with you every step of the way. Thanks be to Jesus. We'll continue by singing the hymn that's printed in the bulletin. <clears throat> To whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. The text I will lay upon your hearts this morning comes from 1 Peter chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 21 through 25. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to the one who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls." Dear friends in Christ, fellow redeemed, I've never been 
much of a great outdoorsman. I did spend a lot of time growing up outside, but I was always playing sports or doing whatever else around the yard that me and my brothers uh, put our minds to. But we rarely spent any time doing those types of activities that make you a great outdoorsman. You know, things like hunting or fishing or hiking or tracking. Those just weren't things that we did. I didn't realize how deficient I was in those areas of my life until I got to college and most of my friends in college were and still are great outdoorsmen. They grew up hunting and fishing and hiking and tracking and doing all those things and so they're very gifted out in nature. They could point to a nondescript spot on the ground and say, oh, deer trail. Or we could be walking through some taller grass and they could point at a, a section and say, this is where the herd laid last night. And to me, it just looked like any other spot of ground. Now, I thought I was missing out on something, so I decided one summer to take hunter's safety and I got my hunter's license and I decided I could now go hunting with them and be a great outdoorsman myself. But I found it just wasn't that simple. They even could point to a deer a couple hundred yards away and say, there it is. You, Sam, you can go get that one. And they could even be pointing right where it was, and I just couldn't see it. My eyes just hadn't been trained to spot the things that they could. And so I thought, you know, I didn't have my whole childhood growing up doing these things, but I do have YouTube, and I could pull up some videos and, and try and learn what to look for, and that way next time I won't make a fool out of myself. But turns out watching a couple 10-minute YouTube videos doesn't make up for a lifetime spent in the great outdoors. Though that's just one of those areas of life that you need to put time in. You need to practice over many years if you're going to be a good outdoorsman. Now today is Good Shepherd Sunday. And every Christian knows that Jesus is the Good Shepherd. Every Christian knows that each of us, we are the sheep, and that as Jesus' sheep, we are to be following our shepherd. But what maybe not everyone realizes is that following in the, in the tracks of our good shepherd, that doesn't come naturally to us. It's not something we generally like doing. In fact, it's a skill that needs to be continually honed and practiced throughout your life. In our text today, the Apostle Peter is going to be sharpening our spiritual tracking skills. So this morning, let us follow the telltale tracks of the Good Shepherd. See where they led him for you, and see now where they lead you for him. Now in this first epistle, the Apostle Peter is writing to his fellow Christians that make up five different regions of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. He's writing to a groups of Christians who have been going through severe persecutions for the faith, and I'm sure are feeling rather defeated. They're suffering. And so he wants to encourage them. And he encourages them to keep up the good fight by pointing them to the only good source of inspiration there is, and that's Jesus Christ. He starts by putting them on the tracks of the good shepherd. He says in the final verse of our text, You were like straying sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. He's telling them, Remember what your lives were like before you became believers. Remember how you were like sheep without a shepherd, how your lives were aimless and without any purpose. He says that before you were living lives filled with pleasure for today, but you weren't thinking at all about what would come tomorrow. Let's not go back to that way of life, he says. Now, I think many of the members here at Emmanuel grew up probably in the church, maybe even this particular church. I think a lot of us were baptized as infants, and so from very early on, we were believers. And yet, even so, every single last one of us, no matter how long we've been in the church, every single last one of us knows what it's like to wander from the flock of God. Every single last one of us has felt the tug of temptation that tries to tear us away from the Good Shepherd. We've each often sampled the sinful pleasures of this world as if we were little children that had $10 to go to the candy store. Yes, every single one of us has struggled. After all, we convince ourselves, well, 
Who's going to know what I had open in my browser window? That's not going to come back to bite me. Or what's the big deal if I get a little drunk every once in a while? Or what harm would it do if I engaged in a little bit of gossip? After all, they're not going to find out, and it probably won't go to hurt them or anything like that. Who cares if we have a little fun here and there? Well, the Lord cares. God cares very much when we abuse his grace and when we take foolish risks with our faith by wandering straight into the jaws of temptation. The prophet Ezekiel, actually from the verses just after our Old Testament reading, uh, through the prophet Ezekiel, God says, As for you, my flock, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I judge between sheep and sheep, between rams and male goats. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must also tread down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of the clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? What an abuse of God's grace. Just think. A person who comes to church on a Sunday morning or gathers around the Word of God online on a Sunday morning and is fed from the pure gospel of God's grace and is assured that all of their sins are indeed forgiven, they have peace with God, and then for that person to go out on Monday morning and to continue living a life that is truly unchristian and unholy and just goes and tramples on God's grace. That's what the apostle, or that's what the prophet Ezekiel is talking about here. That is what it means to abuse God's grace and trample his grace underfoot. And I don't know about you, but this is something that I see in my own life, a failing of my own sinful flesh that I see all too often. I know, personally, just what level of grief the Apostle Paul was feeling when he cried out, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Yes, we realize who we are in this scenario. And who can give us relief from this guilt? Where can we find inspiration to keep on going when life seems to be dragging us down? Well, that's where our text comes in. Peter points us to the telltale tracks of the Good Shepherd. See where his footsteps led him for you, Peter says. In verse 24, he says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. When I was growing up, my mom used to take me and my brothers to the Milwaukee County Zoo uh, regu fairly regularly. And at the Milwaukee County Zoo, I'm sure there's a lot of zoos like this, but everywhere you go, you'll see footprints along the ground. Footprints of a lion or a bear or an alligator or something like that. And the idea is that you can follow those footprints and go and see what you're looking for. Now, it's been quite some time since any of us were at a zoo, since I think all of the zoos around the country are probably closed still right now. And yet, following the tracks following the footprints, that is something that every one of us has done very recently. That's something we did this Lenten season where we were following the footprints of our Savior. Think of Holy Week, when we followed Jesus' footprints as they led him from the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and they led him all the way into Jerusalem, into the upper room where he instituted the Lord's Supper. Then we continued following in our Savior's tracks, as he left that room and went to the Garden of Gethsemane where he prayed earnestly and sweat drops of blood because of how painful this whole experience was for him. And then we see as those footprints led him to the courtroom of Caiaphas and Pontius Pilate where he was falsely accused and where he was arrested and bound and beaten. And then we saw as those footprints now bloodied led him and led us through the city, down the road of sorrows and out beyond the gate. And then they stopped at the foot of the cross because there those same feet were nailed to the cross as Jesus was crucified. All of this, Jesus did for you. Yes, for you and for me as well because 
These are the footprints of Jesus' love. He knew that his death was the only way to guarantee that you could ever live. He knew that for you to get to heaven, he needed to suffer hell on the cross. And he did it. And he paid the price willingly. The Apostle Peter says later in his first epistle, in chapter 8, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, unjust, so that he might bring us to God. Now the question is, was that enough? Was Jesus' death 2,000 years ago, was that really enough to pay for everything that I've done? Not to mention the sins of the entire world. Well, the resurrection on Easter, that was God saying yes. Yes, it was enough. That was the exclamation point of God the Father saying that without a doubt, your guilt is all gone. Your sins have all been blotted out. Your names have been written in the book of eternal life. Now, this Easter season, there ought to be another question that arises in our minds. If we followed through the agonies of Christ's passion during Lent, and then if we stood at the foot of the cross and watched his love poured out for us there on Good Friday, and then if three days later we shared in the joy of Christ's resurrection and we claimed that victory as our own victory, well, if we were able to do all of that, now the question that must arise in our hearts is this. How then shall we live now? What ought our Christian lives to look like? How can I express the joy at knowing that I will never have to answer for any one of my sins? How can I say thank you, Jesus, for everything that he's done for me? Well, again, Peter answers this question by pointing us to the telltale tracks of the Good Shepherd. He says, not only see where they led him for you, but now he says, see where they now lead you for him. Peter writes in the first verse of our text, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Peter's saying, let's follow in the trail of Jesus. Let's follow the footsteps of Jesus, not just with our eyes seeing where he went, but also with our feet going there. Because for the Christian, it's not merely enough to just watch these things and to know that they took place, because for the Christian, the love of the Good Shepherd now compels us to try to follow along as well. Now, I know we don't get much snow much snow i know we don't get any snow down here in winter haven i'm sure we did at one point but probably not in the many number of years but even if you've never experienced snow firsthand at least i'm sure you could picture this up north where it snows all the time throughout the winter it's a very common sight to see a, a dad who's stepping out into a freshly laid layer of snow and then you see a young boy that's following along behind his dad, striving to get into his father's footsteps. And it's always kind of funny to see. You have the dad just casually walking through the snow, and then you have the son who wants to be just like dad, stretching and striving and using all of his length, trying to get right into the middle of his dad's footprints so that he doesn't make any footprints of his own. It's funny to watch that happening, and it's also very touching and kind of endearing to see a young boy that really just wants to try his best to walk and act just like his dad. Now, that's kind of the picture that Peter is presenting for us here, that we, as Christians, the best way to show that we belong to Christ is to follow exactly where he walked, to stretch and to strive to walk exactly in his footprints so that we're not making any marks of our own. And what would that walk look like? Well, Peter describes it in the next verses, starting in verse 22. He says, He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. See, Jesus made his life an example for others. Jesus knew, even when he was being tempted, even in the worst temptations that he faced, that he could not fail because there were so many people that were depending on him. And there are a lot of people depending on you, too. You might not know who they are, but it might be a coworker, 
who's watching your life, trying to figure out what it means to be a Christian and what makes you different. It might be a relative or a family member who's really struggling with some of the big questions in life and is kind of hoping that you might be able to give them some answers. Or as a parent, you never quite realize how closely your children are watching you and emulating you, and they learn from your actions whether faith is just a Sunday morning type of thing or if it really is indeed an everyday of life type of thing. In short, there are a lot of people depending on your Christian witness, so we can't just be closet Christians. We really need to use our mouths Not to deceive, but to point people to God. That's one way our our path should look if we're following in Jesus' footsteps. How else? Well, verse 23 says, When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When the innocent Son of God was suffering on the cross, he refused to curse even those treacherous Jews who were mocking him when he was suffering the most agony ever. Not only did he not curse them, but we're told that Jesus even prayed for them. He said, Father, forgive them. And we also ought to strive to follow that example. When we hear someone cutting down another person, slandering someone else's good name, rather than joining along with it, we ought to stand up for them and put in a good word. When we hear someone casually throwing around God's name, we better stand up for it and tell them just how much that name means to us. When we have people that revile us and speak ill of us, we better not return the same, but rather pray for them. And then verse 23 continues Jesus' trail for us. It says, When he suffered... He did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. And we all face conflict and seeming injustices. And I think, you know, now in this current time in America, there are a lot of supposed injustices that many people are facing and that they want retribution for. And maybe we fall into that category from time to time. But there was no one in human history who suffered more injustice than Jesus, our Savior. But what did Jesus do? He didn't go around trying to get even. He didn't go around trying to find justice for himself. He simply left it all in the hands of his Father. He let his Father settle the score. And let's walk in his footsteps. As Jesus describes in Matthew 5, You've heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. These are just a few of the ways in which we can show our gratitude to God for everything he's done for us. These are just a few of the examples of things that we can do to say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for enduring the scourging and the the sham trial. Thank you for enduring the crown of thorns and the cross. Lord, thank you for earning for me a mansion in the skies and for preparing it and for keeping it ready for me when I arrive. I said at the beginning of our sermon that I thought that by watching 10 minutes of YouTube videos, I'd be able to make up for a lifetime when I hadn't been hunting and tracking. And obviously, now that I look back on it, it sounds kind of foolish and it didn't work out. But that is something I've tried again and again in my life with many other things as well. Whether it be some element of woodworking or learning how to play guitar or trying to learn some pitch that I could throw to when I was pitching during baseball, I always thought if I could just watch what they're doing and just mimic it, I could learn pretty quickly how to do those things that I really want to do. And I tell you what, every single time, even when I emulated their moves and their mechanics exactly, I could never perfect any of those things or even come close to it. It's kind of the same with our walk with Jesus. We're like those children 
trying to stretch and strain and, and use all of our length to get into our Father's footsteps, but try as we might, we are going to fail. We are going to fall face first with our failure. We're going to fall into sin, no matter how hard we try. This side of heaven, we are never going to be able to perfect the walk of our Savior. But even when we fall, Let's turn to our Savior. Let's rely on him and his forgiveness to pick us back up and to set us back on our feet. And let's keep striving to follow that trail anyways. And let's follow it with joy because we've seen where Jesus' footsteps led him for us. So maybe now, by God's grace, we will follow where they lead us out of love and thanksgiving for him. May God grant it. Amen. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. away from danger. All we like sheep have gone astray. We become separated from the flock and in our aloofness fall prey to the wiles of Satan. We are so concerned, consumed with self-concern, so little caring for the needs of others, that suddenly we are friendless and in isolation. We fall victim to our foolishness and naivety. Always the devil lurks like a stalking lion ready to pounce on our smallest blunder. We need your wise counsel and your guidance every passing hour. We give thanks to you, O Savior, that you are our true and faithful shepherd. Others who would lead us are themselves so filled with self-concern that they do for us what serves them best. But you are our true shepherd. 
You have sacrificed all that we might have life and have it more abundantly. You call us by our names. We hear and recognize your voice. We come to you and through you to eternal life. And now, Lord, call all to you who labor and are heavy laden and give them peace. In our own flock are those who especially need your kindness and help at this time, those who are struggling finding work or with financial stress or with sickness or with worry and anxiety. Lord, please help them safely in your arms. Guide them away from harm and danger. Lead them to nurture them. Restore them and show yourself again, their tender shepherd. Now to you and to your Father who has sent you, and to the Holy Spirit who has called us to be your flock, be all our thanksgiving. We praise you and adore you, our Shepherd King, and in your name we also join to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing from the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you. His peace. We'll close with him four thirty six. <laughs> 